an election. A caucus is weird, to be honest with you. It's a weird thing to explain. It's a weird thing to understand. In essence, a caucus is a meeting. They both have the same goal and objective. It's just a different methodology. I cannot even, like, I can sit here and talk to you about the caucus for an hour, and you'd be like, uh, but I'm going to show you a caucus. You can actually see what happens, and then we'll try to kind of put it together a little bit. <laughs> By now, everyone knows that in a presidential year, I went past the first votes that count. But few outside the state have a handle on how this quirky and complicated system works, except our senior political correspondent, Jeff Greenfield. He knows it well and will explain it to us all. Uh, well, Katie, this campaign night tomorrow will be the first test of the presidential campaign. But what, what happens here is no delegates are selected for the national convention. Instead, this is a popularity contest, in effect, and the two parties do it in radically different ways. Both parties hold caucuses in each of Iowa's 1,781 precincts. They might be in a school, a church, a library, even a home. But that's where the similarity ends. He's going to lead our nation uh, with conservative principles. I'm excited to support him. The Republican process is simple, as this caucus training video shows. You show up at 7 p.m. Declare you are a registered Republican. If not, you can register right then and there. And after short speeches by candidates' backers, just a blank sheet of paper, you simply write down the name, and that's collected, and you're done. Secret ballot, a straight up count. The candidate with the most votes wins. A model of simplicity. But the Democrats, not so much. Uh, the registration line is nearing and is. Democrats show up at 6 30, the doors close at 7. And then, instead of a secret ballot, caucus goers publicly declare their choices by moving into different corners of the room, into presidential preference groups. And he's got some rank enthusiasm out there that is unbelievable. And there shouldn't even be any more. As this 2004 caucus in Adair shows, you have to stand up in front of perhaps your boss or spouse and declare your choice. Doesn't that raise the possibility of intimidation? It is neighbors talking to neighbors about who they are selecting for the nominee. It is free and it is open and you are there of your own volition. A head count is taken and critically, a candidate must achieve a certain level of support, usually 15%, to achieve viability. So if there are 50 people in the room, you must have at least eight in your corner to be viable. You might think of this as a first step in an elimination round. If your candidate is declared not viable, you can either go home or realign, joining up with a candidate who has survived by moving into another corner of the room. You know what? What happens then is something between earnest debate and old-fashioned horse trading, as in 2004 when backers of John Kerry and John Edwards argued and pleaded with backers of Howard Dean to join up with them. So I think we can Thank play you. the Dean people over the show. Once realignment is done, a final headcount is made, and each precinct awards delegates not to the national conventions, but to the Iowa Democratic County conventions. Drake University professor Dennis Goldford does his best to explain. The number of the people in the preference group times the number of delegates to that precinct sent to the county convention divided by the total number of caucus participants in that precinct. Right. What really matters, what everybody will be talking about, of course, is the final statewide percentages for Clinton, Edwards, Obama's, and all the other Democrats. Meanwhile, Jeff, after all the money, the messages, the media, the analyst polls, what do you expect will make a headline out of here? The unexpected. A measurable win or loss for one of the Democrats, a surge by somebody like John McCain or Fred Thompson, and also the winnowing out. We may see as many as four candidates drop out of this race after Iowa. We'll talk about it more tomorrow night. Jeff Greenfield, thanks so much. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Well, a uh, couple reasons. The entire system is really complicated because the Constitution specified very little. So we have allowed every state to kind of come up with their own way of handling it. Um, this was not a very democratic process in the beginning. Not a lot of people were able to participate. So the system worked. But as we've extended suffrage and we've let more and more people vote, that's kind of exacerbated it. Um, that is the Iowa caucus. That doesn't mean that that's what the Nevada caucus looks like. In Texas, up until last year, the Democrats in Texas had a primary and a caucus. But they did away with their caucus in the last competition, and they only had a primary. They could, in 2020, change it, and they could add it back. You've got to get, and you've got to understand that, that the reason is because who develops all of these rules about what your state's going to do? 
Like, where does this information come from? About having a primary or having a caucus and how it's going to run and how it's going to work. Who makes all those decisions? The state legislature and your state party system are the ones that are going to control that. So it's not like it's set in stone. There's not like a singular process. And that's really what makes it so incredibly, incredibly complicated. So what we're going to do next class, because we don't really have time to kind of wrap our brains around that. When you guys come back, we are going to basically have a primary with some candidates. And then we're going to have a caucus with those same candidates. We're going to kind of compare the results and see this, like how, how that works out. Okay. But the major difference is, if I asked you to tell me what a primary was in one word, what would you call it? An election. What would you call a caucus? A meeting, okay? And the people who are chosen to represent us as a result of that primary or caucus, what do you keep, keep hearing me or in the video, what do we keep calling them? Delegates. So that's an important word if you didn't get that. The whole goal of the primary or caucus stage is a delegate. A delegate is a person just like you and I who is going to represent at the county convention, state convention, and potentially national convention that's going to represent the people of their precinct. So like we live in a precinct, that's a geographic area, and then we have conventions at the county, state, and national level. The primary and caucus determine who the delegates are that are going to represent at each of those levels. Uh huh. Um, there's not a singular way uh, being involved in the party, you know, like showing up at meetings. I would think as a young person in this area, if you are a Democrat, there would be a lot of opportunities for you because the Democratic Party is not as strong. But generally speaking, parties love it when old people, parties love it when young people want to do stuff. So going to the national convention is going to be tough. Going to the county convention would not be particularly difficult. You know, if you're willing to go, they need people to go. So. so every party, like, because just because of federalism, so we have Collin County Republicans and Democrats, and we have Texas Republicans and Democrats, and then a national, and there's like a governing board, basically, so it's kind of like a student council, it's like an organization, and those leaders will pick, so maybe they have an application, maybe they have a sign-up sheet, maybe they send out a Google form, it just depends. Not necessarily, yeah. We'll get there eventually. All right, you guys, make sure that you check the Learning Hub for your homework.